I just saw, I just bought babyrings.com. I'm going to start making a killing. <laughs> Literally making a killing because I got to make those rings somehow. You're behind on your quota. <laughs> <laughs> This is how I'll be able to see the comments is putting my glasses like this. <laughs> yeah, you have to fix your glasses. <laughs> I got to get another screen with just the comments. It's like gigantic. <laughs> so it'll be so big, you'll just see a glow on me. That's that's what I do when I live stream. I have the chat blown up really big on my laptop. So yeah. I, <laughs> I think the lap look. But they go by so fast. We did this a month ago. I was fine. Now, for some reason. I don't feel so bad. Right. I mean, it's a little Work fuzzy, but I can time. read it. All right. Hey, welcome back to another episode of 1980s Now, a weekly examination of the importance of 1980s pop culture and its influence today. My name's Will. And joining me as always on this uh, live stream of our latest uh, podcast episode, or live recording of our latest podcast episode, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. friends and co-hosts, Kat and John. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. Hey there, 1980s. <laughs> how you doing? Wow. So many oh, nice. uses. It's going to become like the F word, right? Yeah, right. It can be a verb, an adjective. <laughs> Context. <laughs> Adverb. L -Y. Not, I guess we don't want it to be a swear word, though. That would be bad. No. Mm. no. Hey, don't forget to no, listen to John em emphasis. <laughs> on his other uh, <laughs> podcast, because in addition to his co-hosting duties here, he hosts his very own, his very own grown-up adult mature mm. podcast. No, it's more like a podcast where, where three guys fighting to avoid any responsibility <laughs> exactly. associated with That's adulthood. Right. Uh, Gen X grown up. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, on today's show, we're going to be talking about 1980s radio or radio in the 1980s. Are prime Look, I've got some information to share with you, but primarily I wanted to get your take on this because like so many of the things we mm -hmm. talk about, I know what my experience is. And mm -hmm. not only is that unique to me, and I know that already, but if, if, if at all it's uh, common, it may be limited to my region, especially with radio in the 80s, because unlike radio today or the methods we have for receiving music and talk and news, mm -hmm. it was fairly localized. And uh, mm -hmm. this reminds me, if you haven't heard, and this episode was inspired by our conversation we just had with Larry the Duck Dunn. And this is a perfect ah. example because... Uh, you know, Larry was uh, was the uh, he was the uh, music director for most of the '80s. He was also an on-air uh, talent at WLIR in New York. And talk about regional. This was a <laughs> Long Island. Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> I, I'm laughing because the way you phrased it, you said he was the music director for most of the '80s. <laughs> He just ran the decade, but then yes. the rest of the sentence came and it got less funny, but it was oh. funny to me at first. <laughs> Your brain's working faster. Did you hear that, Kat? That's what yeah. she heard. I didn't, it I'm didn't like, click, but now that you say it. He's a busy it, guy. That's a big job. <laughs> to be right. the music director for the 80s. It's intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. He, he did a good job, I'll say. Bad so. respect, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but talking about, you know, the sort of regional thing about music was, you know, so this Long Island station that had a real impact ultimately on the nation, but at the time, mm -hmm. Only within, the, you know, whatever radius this uh, signal reached, you were able to hear these bands that other folks in our country hadn't heard yet. Duran Duran, U2, Howard yeah. Jones, et cetera, and so on. So I'm, I'll be curious to find out about your experiences as well. All right. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to be talking about, uh, oh, before that, we're going to be review current news stories related to 1980s media, including Beetlejuice 2. Finally seems like it's uh, coming. Oh, you know what? I forgot to write it down. Mm. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to go through my paper here. Uh, let's oh, see what shuffle, shuffle. oh, uh, how the, uh, let's see the writers, you know, the writers guild is, uh, is on strike right now, but this reminds us of a mm -hmm. similar yes. experience in the 1980s. Uh, <laughs> yep. Maybe it's a cautionary tale. A notorious one. Yes. Oh, sad news regarding MTV news, which ins inspires this segment every week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Dolly Parton's got a new album arriving this fall, but it's not country. All right. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, before we talk about any of that, a quick announcement. Hey, uh, an announcement for you, Kat and John, too. We're off next week. We're going to be off we next are? week. Next week is just too crazy. Uh, and I know All instead right. of uh, full-assing an episode or zero-assing, whichever is the bad one, <laughs> just meet us in the middle. Can we just, just halfway do it? Half -ass it? We do that every week, John. <laughs> Oh, now I'm suggesting okay, so. it's going to be worse. Either That's the full ass. How would anyone know the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. Hmm, how can we make this show worse? Well, right now it's pretty bad. Compare it to this, I guess. Well, we can improve it by not being having a new episode that day. <laughs> I guess is what I'm suggesting. 
But, uh, Self-promotion. <laughs> Shameless. <laughs> Next week is too crazy. Uh, Don't oversell it. Careful. <laughs> because this upcoming weekend, May 19th through May 21st, I know I'll be busy uh, attending okay. Motor City Comic Con in Novi, oh. Michigan. It's a, a suburb of uh, right. Detroit. I'll be uh, mm-hmm. with my buddy Yuri again this upcoming oh, weekend. Cool. Hey, if you're going to be nice. there, come and say hi. Motor City Comic Con. Hmm. Uh, go to uh, MotorCityComicCon.com for yeah, yeah. more information. Yeah. All right. So there, you guys got a week mm-hmm. off. Which means wow. the follow the week after that, our <gasps> episode's going to be even better than this one. So then you're going to get the full ass or no ass, whichever <laughs> is the best of the asses to have. It's personal hmm. preference. Choose your own. Huh. <laughs> right. Roll choose your own your ass level. Choose, yes. choose your ass. Choose your level. own ass. Mm-hmm. Hmm. All right. Hey, uh, let's, whatever. I'm not going to even try to risk a segue on that one. Let's just get caught up on 1980. Good call. That's experience talking right there. You know better than to try to segue out of that. Well done. (laughs) Yeah, I know how to bail out sometimes. Oh, look at that. See, we'll be off and Nick says he'll be listening to Gen X Grown Up. GXG. There you go. There you go. There you go. Not just G. I imagine he listens to both whenever he, you know, whenever new ones are available, but. No, I I don't expect so. I expect there's finally an excuse to listen to the other one, which I appreciate. Give us a shot. Thank you. I've always said we're better than nothing. (laughs) Hmm. Now there's some self-promotion. Now, can you please explain that using the ass system? (laughs) Oh, the ass Mm, system. Oh, we're. (laughs) Or any anatomical part. Now, I know ass probably refers to donkey. I was going right? to try, and then you cut me off. It must refer to donkey, donkey right? If you're half-assing, you don't have a, enough ass to pull your cart or something like that. Oh. Maybe. Hmm. Yeah, where does that even come from? Unless it's, a in the, it's, a, it's an inside donkey, which case the smaller would be preferable because it would knock things over. Hmm. So then you'd like a half-ass because it'd be like a little dog. Now, what if the, the donkey is born with just one buttock? Would it be a quarter ass? Hmm. Huh. You'd be quarter assing it if you only had one donkey that was on the inside or whatever John said. All right. Hey, as reported yeah, by Dead... So. Nobody cares about this. As reported by a Deadline, <laughs> Beetlejuice 2 will open on September 6th, 2024. Wow, that's awfully specific. This is life. This is already a life-changing piece of news. When I saw this pop in the other day, because yeah. like serendipitously, me. my daughter yes. is planning to get a giant sandworm tattoo uh-huh. on her lower calf. Oh my gosh. On so September 6th, 2024? No, 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 oh. no. But like in, in the next month or so, she was kind of planning it. And now I'm like, oh. maybe you wait and see if the second movie wrecks it and you don't want a sandworm <laughs> on your leg. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Already have a backup plan of what you could turn it into. Right. Mm. Right. You make it, uh, it's the medical caducis all of a sudden. Right. I turn, yeah. Oh, I, I love doctors is what it yeah. is. It never was. <laughs> <laughs> to go to medical school just to make up for the tattoo. <laughs> right. Seven years later. <laughs> to bail out. Mm. <laughs> well, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So just a few days ago, Warner Brothers announced that the ghost with the most will return to the screen in an all adventure, an all new adventure next fall. Yikes. I did say it three times. You did. I was looking around. Oh, I'm making sure. I meant to stop short. It startled me. Uh, and hey, the great news is, I think the better news is, right? Because we've heard talk of Beetlejuice 2 ever since Beetlejuice 1 concluded <laughs> in the 1980s mm-hmm. with a, thank goodness they never made it. Beetlejuice goes to Hawaii and I'm not making that up. That's true. Look it up. <laughs> wow. Uh, Tim Burton is reteaming with Michael Keaton to make this uh, wow. sequel to the cult classic from 1988. This was a hot time for Michael Keaton because, uh, you know, he was already Mm -hmm. building his star power slowly over the decade. But then with this Mm one-two punch of Beetlejuice with Tim Burton, and then shortly after starring as Batman slash Bruce Wayne in Burton's uh, Mm -hmm. 1989 Mm -hmm. Batman. That's it. He was done. He was on the map. So his star power was solidified. And I think I was a big fan of his prior to that, you know, with his comedies, uh, Mr. Mom and oh, yeah. uh, Gung Ho. Night shift, note to self, edible paper. Note to self, edible paper. Is <laughs> that a night shift quote? Yeah. Because he was going around with the little, uh, little handheld recorder. And every time he came up with something, he would go, note to self. And he, because <laughs> he was making that. inventions all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Winkler was like trying to throw paper away and he couldn't find the trash can. He's like, note to self, edible mm-hmm. paper. <laughs> oh, Brad says the only thing good about Beetlejuice was Winona Ryder. Yep, I said it. Oh, really? Brad, fisticuffs. Wow. <laughs> I rewatched it. I rewatched it and very hi, Brad. recently. And uh, Nick says, ouch. It's, it's a good film. It's a solid film. It's just fun. I think it's the kind of film, though, that someone could oversell to you. You know, if you've never seen it, Kat. Mm-hmm. And if hmm. someone really talked it up. I've seen wait it. a minute. Why is it Kat? 
We've never seen it, cat. I just was rolling. I was playing statistics. I've seen it and my friend in high school and I had a joke. We'd kept saying Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice three times yes. to each other. It was a long time ago, though. It is on my rewatch yeah. list. Hmm. So I can refresh myself on the details. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, Karen reminds us that it features the music of the late, great Harry Belafonte. That's true. <gasps> I remember Jump in that. Line. Oh, boy. Yep. That's what I think of. Yeah, and I would say for, you know, I had a, I want to say, those are kinds of songs we might've heard from older generations having played already. And so mm-hmm. I was semi-familiar with Harry Belafonte, but that for me, I've learned more songs. And I think our generation learned all, some people just learned those songs, period. A very good friend mm-hmm. of mine, he was, it's, it's funny because you would never suspect this because this is a guy into rock and hip hop. Uh-huh. Suddenly all he wanted to listen to was Harry, like the greatest hits, Harry Belafonte all, <laughs> over and over again. That's awesome. Also of, of interesting note is that joining the cast is Wednesday's Jenna Ortega, who also just worked with uh, mm. Tim Burton on that the mm-hmm. TV series, mm-hmm. which was a great show, mm-hmm. by the way, if you haven't seen it. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, the script is written by uh, Alfred Go. Go, I think you say his name. I never said his name out loud. And Miles... Miller, which I know how to say that one, even though it's spelled differently. With earlier mm-hmm. drafts from Seth Graham Smith, uh, who was the writer of, uh, what was that, that Abraham Lincoln Hunt's Vampires movie and oh, wrote really Pride idea. and Prejudice and Zombies. And he's written, a, mm-hmm. he's written a ton of stuff. I'm sorry, Seth, for not remembering. Mm-hmm. So you, you guys know what the movie is about. In addition to the film, it also spawned a television series, an animated television series that was also produced by Burton that ran from September of 89 through October of 1991. I think I caught yeah. it briefly because I was just curious and I was like, eh, this isn't our Beetlejuice. This is mm-hmm. something a little different. Mm-hmm. And that was the end of that. The best contribution the cartoon made was all the action figures. That was cool. Mm. Just like the real Ghostbusters had all the goofy action figures with the pop out yes. eyes and everything. Right. With the eyes. Yeah, yeah. The, the Beetlejuice yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. cartoon had a ton of action figures too. Oh, Michael says probably no Alec Baldwin this time. Right. Yeah. He's probably laying low, I would think. But uh, Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, well, I mean, they were dead. So he and Gina oh. Davis should not be That's aging. True. And so now they're 40 oh, years old oh. or, or so now. So that would be hard to explain. I mean. That's a couple of reasons I mean, there. You couldn't, you couldn't say they're dead because they already were, but I mean, they mm-hmm. should not have aged. Right. So you have Brent Spiner <laughs> data syndrome, right? With these people that should not have aged. What syndrome? Yeah. Uh, that's a. <laughs> Star Trek thing. Oh. Yeah. They'd have to go all Harold Ramis and, you know, what they did in the Ghostbusters. Uh, mm-hmm. after life, so. Yeah. Right. That's a good point, John. Yes. You know, and sp- speaking of the, you know, actors in the film, Jenna Ortega. Look, I, I love Jenna Ortega. My, my first uh, saw her performing in this show that I watched with my younger daughter, uh, Stuck in the Middle. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, she was the star of that mm-hmm. show. It was like, a, I don't know if it was a Disney show, but it was one of those kids channels. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? I was talking to Brad. How are you talking to Brad by mouthing words on a podcast? <laughs> are you like well, doing ASL us. for him? What is, what are you, uh, what is. <laughs> he answered my question. Oh, for crying out loud. Cat, type in the chat if you want to talk. All right. All right. Everyone, Sorry, we're having a take... meeting here. No side conversations. Turn off your phones. <laughs> uh, but, but, look, I love Jenna Ortega. I think she's fantastic. She was great in Wednesday. But isn't this Wednesday character a little too on the nose to now? Mm-hmm. I mean, Wednesday is very much in that vein of uh, the, Lydia, the Lydia Dietz character that Winona Ryder played. So yeah. I don't know. We don't know who she's going to play. Some rumors are that she's going to be Lydia's daughter, but we don't know that for sure. It does feel like the same character again, but also we don't know. It could be that yeah. Lydia's daughter fell far from the tree and does not have that kind of goth leaning sort of thing. It could mm. just be that she's a great actress and oh, mm-hmm. yeah. she's got the darkness in her, but it'd be more fun to have Lydia's daughter upbeat and bright Sunshine and rainbows, pigtails yeah. and just and happy right. and cheerful and not this you know this character right john I, I, they're gonna do that that's my plan that's what i well that's how, that's that's how you get interest is you play against expectation and type that's mm-hmm. why it's cool right you you yeah. go to see the guy that loved doing something and you start the movie he hates it he has to get his way back so mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. there we go put me in the writer's room i'll take care of it. <laughs> yeah put him in the writer's room right, for crying yeah. out. <laughs> uh, but yeah but you're right jenna and tim burton teaming together yeah they would undoubtedly do the smart thing which is what you're suggesting Mm -hmm. Uh, of Mm -hmm. course the movie also spawned a 2019 broadway musical which was also produced by warner brothers that's right Uh, right. of course it it closed briefly during the the covid uh times but it reopened in april 2022 and then it just recently closed again at the beginning of this year it is on tour though and it's fantastic if you have a chance to see it it's absolutely hilarious and spectacular Mm -hmm. it's in the spirit no pun intended of the films of the film (laughs) It was awesome. I think it's only, uh, it was just off, it was on Broadway when I saw it. I saw it there some years back. And oh, and I've probably seen about half a dozen 
shows on Broadway and the only ones that were worth the money and time I invested to see them on Broadway <laughs> yeah. were this one yeah. and Book really? of Mormon. It's two oh, spectacular yeah. shows. Uh, really good others too. were kind of like, oh my God, are we still, what's the the jerky boys or whatever, the dancing pants or whatever the things are on what? Broadway now? I don't know. Jerky boys, the musical? I'm curious about that. <laughs> jerky boys are on Broadway? It's something boys, something about pants. <laughs> oh, like I don't fancy know. Pants. Anyway, oh, see, yeah, that's how Jersey, much I remember them. Jersey boys. <laughs> that's oh, it. That's it. Guys. It was that one. Yes. Jerky boys. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> Somehow he mushed jerky mm. and or jersey and yeah. pants and wow. Jerky pants. <laughs> All right. Hey, in other 1980s news, I didn't write a title for this one. Let's make it up. Uh, hmm. <laughs> the uh, Writers Guild of America, uh, hmm. the current Writers Guild of America strike reminds us of uh, one that happened in the 1980s with dire <laughs> consequences. No kidding. Right. Okay. That's by your attention. Yeah. Well. All right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure undoubtedly you've heard if you're a fan of pop culture like we are undoubtedly you, mm-hmm. you've learned that uh, just on May 2nd after six, week of ne- six weeks of negotiation with yep. the Alliance mm-hmm. of Motion Picture and Television Producers the Writers Guild the WDGA, WGA which represents mm-hmm. about 11,500 uh, people who write the Hollywood shows movies mm-hmm. uh, that we love uh, going to see in the theaters and watching at home well they began a strike uh, they've got picketing yeah. going in uh, New York City yeah. Uh, Los Angeles in Atlanta with these strikes, uh, the ensuing strikes shutting down productions because it turns out you need writers. Mm, who knew? To do shows. Yeah, well, then don't put me in the writer's room until we get this cleared up. Then. <laughs> get out. Get in the writer's room. Just- now get out. <laughs> they put him in the writer's room, then hand him a sign. <laughs> and then here. Yeah. <laughs> so as a result of the strike, no member of the WGA, WGA, well, it's kind of tricky. Mm-hmm. WGA will write new scripts mm. or TV shows and movies until. The membership votes to end the strike, just like, you know, mm-hmm. unions, just like, you know, unions. Uh, yep. For most writers, this also means foregoing mm-hmm. income that they normally get uh, writing uh, during the strike. The folks they're negotiating with, by the way, this uh, this AMPTP is negotiating on behalf of everyone you know that makes uh, content. Netflix, mm-hmm. Amazon, oh. Apple, Disney, Discovery, Warner, NBC, Universal, Paramount, and Sony. The issue at this point is the streaming. Uh, in, in short, the effect that streaming has had on writer compensation and residuals, just mm-hmm. like you, you look, this is a common story, stuff like this, the government uh, companies paying em- with regard to salaries for employees, mm-hmm. they fail to keep pace with the times. And in this case, mm-hmm. it's technology. Yes. So streaming creates these different challenges or opportunities and everyone's getting compensated except the writers, it seems yep. like. So as a result of the current strike, uh, a number of Star Trek writers have taken to social media to su- show their support mm-hmm. for, the, for oh, their uh, cool. their uh, writing family, like Strange mm-hmm. New Worlds co-runner, co-showrunner Henry Alonso Myers. Uh, now, the strike mm-hmm. will have no impact on the upcoming second season because it's already in the can. It's, it's set to air soon, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, uh, June, mm-hmm. in June, mm-hmm. June 15th. June 15th, yep. But mm-hmm. the strike could affect the recently announced third season, which is supposed to film this summer. Yep. Unless Ooh, they've yes. already written everything. And mm-hmm. none of the f- people that are working on the show decide, hey, uh, you know, I'm still going to support my fellow uh, pr- artists and not mm-hmm. work either. Because we've had some examples of that, too. Folks who yep. do non-writing jobs saying, you know what, I'm not going to show up either. Because, mm-hmm. which is, you know, that's how you uh, get these companies to change their minds is solidarity. Yeah. That's it in a nutshell. Anyway, taking us uh, back, that's the now portion, Kat. Uh, taking it back to the <laughs> 1980s, we're reminded of the longest WGA strike, which lasted for 153 days that was the one that happened mm-hmm. in 1988. Mm-hmm. It was it's similar at the time. There was a, 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 the issue was with regard to residuals then, which is part of the issue today. Uh, then it was that the uh, I think the 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 producer the production companies were seeing that there was a viewership was down with regard to I guess uh, you know reruns and shows that would generate residuals, and so they decided that they wanted to you know cut or reduce the amount that the writers were getting cut in on. And the writer's like, what? why punish me? I still wrote it. Right. You're still making some money. Right. I just want yeah. per- the percentage. You make less, yes. I make less. It's a percentage. Mm-hmm. Anyway, here's a real world example from the 1980s, how, it, how these strikes impact the media we love. And I'm going to need John's full support on this because he's our resident <laughs> expert. No problem. Speaking of Star Trek in 19... 19- oh, something Star Trek is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just mentioned Star Trek. And in 1988, just as the second season of Star Trek, the next generation was to begin production, just like today, the WGA went on strike. Yep. Now, while ultimately mm-hmm. 
TNG is, you know, is, is a fan favorite, one of my favorites, certainly incarnations of the uh, Star Trek uh, world. The strike gave us, which is what is widely accepted as the worst season of that show. <laughs> Uh, a couple things happened. And one included, it, it, to keep things going, the uh, producers had to get creative. And not creative in the good sense, like where you come up with great ideas. Yeah. Creative yeah. in the sense that they think of cost-cutting measures. Yep. Uh, oh, and ways to work yeah. without writers. <laughs> first, the season, well, well, the first season and every season since had 26 episodes. This one wound up having only 22. Yep. And other tactics, they used other tactics. Uh, like the first episode of the season, The Child, I had never heard this, John was initially mm -hmm. written for the unmade 1970s Star Trek spinoff that was to be called Star Trek Phase 2. Phase 2. two. That's right. Yeah. They used a lot of leftover scripts uh, for a yeah. lot of the first se season or two of The Next Generation because Phase 2 was a thing. And so there are about six or seven episodes in that first two seasons from that. Even when the original series got canceled, there were a few treatments and possibly not quite complete scripts that would have been like Kirk and Company shows. Mm. that they leverage during this strike to say, oh, well, it's basically written. We just got to map characters on different people because you kind of have like, you need the cold logical, so goals to make it data. Right. Well, you need the, <laughs> the swashbuckling guy, we'll make it Riker. Like you can map a lot of that stuff and get them doing similar things. But when you know what mm -hmm. they are and you go, oh, I see how that probably was initially going to be Spock or initially going to be Sulu or something when you see them mapped okay. on. Yep. Uh, and unfortunately, <laughs> yep. you know, a couple of other things happened as a result of this truncated season was, even though the strike had ended by July of 89, it, it, the effects were still being felt. One of the changes mm. that came out of the strike was a, something with regard to the accounting, which affected their budget. And so they had a couple mm. of episodes that essentially ate up a lot of the money uh, for their shows, including period costumes and sets for elementary dear data, Q Who, mm. which features mm -hmm. elaborate Borg makeup and Borg ship sets. Those two episodes, the rumor goes, drained the coffers and left us with the final episode of the season, which just ended on a whimper, uh, Shades yep. of Grey. Oh my. Uh, which for the first time in history, <laughs> Star Trek did something that other shows do to save money routinely. And in the 80s, mm -hmm. it was like every season you could count on this. And even in the 90s, I remember is doing a clips mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in a comedy show, like in sitcoms, they've done this oftentimes. It's easy. Remember that time when we, and then we get to right. see the jokes again, and if the jokes, you know, you watch reruns of comedy shows because the laughs still hold up. Yeah. I remember it being bad at the time. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. It, like, yeah, so okay. this, would, this would, would have been, <laughs> what, uh, early 89 by the time, <laughs> mid, like first quarter 89 when Shades of Grey finally aired. And this is when I was... I was still, I was still, I was still living in central Florida, I guess. Hadn't yet gone off to college, but, but I would watch yeah. it with friends and we would get together and we couldn't wait to watch the next episode. We do it because we were all nerds and wanted to see that. And we watched that yeah. one and we're all just kind of, you know, you get about 15 <laughs> minutes into it because it starts as a regular episode, but then, okay, and then I won't bore you with, it's not worth me dignifying the show with an explanation <laughs> of the synopsis. The point is something <laughs> happens where they, oh, let's trigger a bunch of Riker's mm. memories to help him make his way back from this problem he has, this disease that he's fallen to. Right. And mm -hmm. the notable thing was, like you said, Will, it was like, remember that time we did such and such and you go to the clip? They yeah. didn't even set up the clips. <laughs> right. They just had these <laughs> oh, bits no. where they would go, let's try this memory. And it wasn't until I read this article that this made yeah. sense. The <laughs> actors didn't even know what clip they were going to put in. <laughs> yeah. They just said, yep. let's just film the, the, the heads and tails. Let's try this memory. Okay, cut. Ready to no. do another one? That yeah. one didn't work. Let's try this memory. And they didn't know what the clips were going to be even. Yeah. And even at the time I remember watching it and going, Star Trek is doing this. What's going on? I know <laughs> I wasn't aware of the writer's guild strike because I wasn't that privy to what was going on in media, but I could tell mm -hmm. this was a bad episode of Star Trek. And because they didn't do that and it was dumb and it was mm. pretty much all happened in the sick bay. It was bleh. <laughs> bleh. <laughs> uh, the season two head writer, Maurice Hurley, who was later fired for other reasons, said Shades oh. of Grey was a quote, piece of shit, end quote. <laughs> and he wrote it succinctly said, that's correct <laughs> and I read this uh, clip uh, there's an excerpt from an interview with him when he said we knew it was bad at the time mm -hmm. yeah Brad says the strike has impacted Stranger Things too they stopped filming oh yeah there you go yeah. I'm sure yeah. I, I, it's, it's impact things we can't imagine because look at the lead time that streaming yeah. shows have these days right yeah. I mean, some of them, some of them are like 10 hour movies that they're putting together. And there's like strange new worlds. We just said is about to come out in June. It was filmed over mm -hmm. a year ago. Mm -hmm. So, so this is going to impact, this is going to have ripples for the next 18 months, probably assuming yeah. it's resolved at some point. It could be longer. Well, a few of our listeners are planning on catching up on all the things that they're behind there on you go. <laughs> during Take this advantage. time. 
Miss So, Karen Flieger. Watch the Muppets Mayhem. Oh, have you watched it? I watched the first episode. It's spectacular. Okay. All right, I haven't yet. I saw a review of it today. I was avoiding. Oh my gosh. I it's lost a, track of It's that. a little saccharine because it's Disney owned, but once you get past that, it's Muppets. It's the Muppets themselves are still oh. kind of wink and nod, kind of slyly doing stuff they shouldn't. Yeah. I love it. Hey, another 1980s news as reported by Ultimate Classic Rock. A new Dolly Parton album will arrive this mm-hmm. fall. Got a lot of stuff, new stuff coming up here. Dolly Parton has announced that her upcoming rock album, <laughs> Rockstar, <laughs> will arrive on November 17th. So, look, let me take you back to 2022. If you remember when uh, Dolly was uh, nominated for the Rock Hall, she politely refused, saying, mm-hmm. quote, I do hope that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will understand and be willing to consider me again if I'm ever worthy. This has, however, inspired me to put out a hopefully great rock and roll album at some point in the future, which I have always wanted to do, end quote. And there you go. Uh, from that, um, I don't know what, uh, gracious, uh, trying to graciously bow out of uh, an award that, you know, <laughs> folks often lament is just for rock and roll, for crying mm-hmm. out loud, <laughs> came this new album. And uh, now we have a list, uh, the track listing. We were teased a little bit with some of the other she was going to work with. And now we have a full track listing and a full accounting for all the folks that are going to be, uh, she's going to be uh, singing with. And looks amazing. Oh, it looks amazing. Yeah. Like, I don't care if you like Dolly Parton or not, which what kind of evil person does like Dolly Parton? She's an amazing <laughs> yeah. philanthropist. Yeah. If you like rock or not, if you like country or not, this mm-hmm. roster is like a who's who of amazing talent yesterday and today. It's just crazy. Right. Yeah. And the only thing I could think about with regard to a Dolly Parton addition to that is, boom, boom. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Are you really. fighting underwater specters again? <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, but the, cool look, look, the folks she's collaborating with and the cover song she's doing, so much 80s goodness represented here. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, including uh, yes. Sting, Steve Perry, Ann Wilson, Debbie Harry, Kevin Cronin, you know, of Ario Speedwagon. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition to that, both surviving Beatles, Ringo, I think this is a terrible way to say it, right? Both surviving Beatles. What are you doing, Kat? Beatles. Are you doing well, another show? What are you doing? I'm waiting. No, I'm waiting <laughs> Wait, to hear. Okay. <laughs> are you waiting to hear who it is? And I'm, I'm, there's more coming, uh, surely, on this list that you're listing. <laughs> <laughs> I had something to say about the Beatles and you didn't even get to it because Kat ruined it. I just, I see waving I'm out of the corner Mom. of my eye. I figure you're trying to get my attention. No. I, She's waving I, at the people appearing I, in chat. I, I think so. I was so, waving maybe. at Marcus. I was waving at Marcus. I'm going to say it. I'm going to end the story before that. You'll see. Watch. <laughs> no, no. Watch how this goes. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, anyway, I think this is a terrible way to say this, right? Both surviving Beatles. I don't know. Something feels really icky about saying it that way. <laughs> Would you rather them say neither dead Beatle? Well, how about just the Beatles? Or how about just Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney? I feel like there's a death watch going on, you know, the countdown. <laughs> when I first read it, it said uniting the, the Beatles, I yeah. think. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Is there a Ouija board? Oh, there's only one here? way to do that. <laughs> John Lennon, John Lennon, John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, both surviving Beatles, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney appear on Parton's cover of Let It Be, for example, with, with mm-hmm. Mick, Mick Fleetwood and Peter Frampton. Um, and here is uh, some additional songs I think of interest to our particular fans here. Uh, she'll be performing Rockstar, the titular album. That's not just for Dolly. Every time you just get the same name and the thing. And the, okay, <sighs> Titular album, special guest, <laughs> Richie Sambora of, of Bon Jovi, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, Every Beth, Breath You Take, featuring P. Diddy. Did <laughs> <laughs> you quit it? <laughs> He's going to owe Sting again. <laughs> Every Breath You Take with Sting. Uh, open Arms, Steve Perry, Magic Man with the Ann Wilson. Uh, long as I can see the light, John Fogarty, I want you back, Stephen mm. Tyler, Purple Rain, mm-hmm. I guess by yourself there. I hate myself for loving you, <laughs> Joan Jett. Uh, keep that. on loving you, Kevin Cronin. She's just basically doing covers with the original artist. This is crazy. So, point of yeah. order. Yeah, it, yeah, the article said cover, cover, cover. Mm-hmm. If the original artist is on the track, Ooh. is it technically mm-hmm. a cover anymore? Oh, such a good question. Interesting. Because yeah. if an original artist re-records it, it's just mm-hmm. the song or a re-recorded version of the song. And yeah. there's a lot of yeah, that going yeah. around to get rights back. Like you don't have the rights to the original recording, so you re-record it. I've seen mm. that. But mm. is it even a cover anymore? I mean, a sting is on every breath you take. Is that a cover of the song? Yeah. Well, right. 
take it a step back because we have this happen sometimes. And sometimes we had it just when, when, when streaming started uh, becoming a platform for music, right? Like mm-hmm. I, Def Leppard comes to mind. I've used them as, as this example for this. And so there's not to be too technical, but right. So Def Leppard in the 1980s rec- made an album. They recorded an album, even though they wrote the songs and wrote the music, for example, let's talk about original Def Leppard song. Mm-hmm. When it gets released, they may not own the actual song. Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm. They own that iteration the publishing, of it, but not mm-hmm. the, yes, the mechanical, mm-hmm. right. So hmm. what, when streaming came out and they weren't on the platform and they had no right to say to the record company, they couldn't force the record company to do it. They just re-recorded all their songs I know, and exactly. tried to make them sound like the original. So are those considered covers or not? I guess that's, if we can figure that out, we'll know your answer. I think, I think that's it. Are. Yeah. I, I don't think they're covers, but I see Brad yeah. in the chat going, it's not the original. Agreed. hundred so percent agreed right. that the question is though, is it a cover? I would say it's not. I, I, I guess you could go to, let's go to Webster and see what it says. I, to me, yeah. a cover is someone else doing a song mm-hmm. that is traditionally known or best known by an entirely different artist. But if you have the the best yeah. known artist on the song, mm-hmm. it's an awesome duet. Yeah. Trio or quadrangle or whatever you have when you get yeah. more people, but it's not a cover, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Right, right. Quartet. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, you Quadrangle, know, just, it's wrong. <laughs> just like they came up with a reboot, cool. we need something else. Maybe that's, yeah, re- maybe exactly. it's reboot. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, also, uh, Heart of Glass, Debbie Harry, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, Elton John, We Are the Champions, Bygones with uh, Rob Halford with special guests, Nikki Six and John Five. All the numbers. Uh, My Blue Tears featuring Simon Le Bon. There it is. Is My Blue Tears a Duran Duran song? No. I think I think it's a Dolly Parton song. Actually, I forgot okay. to look it up. Yeah, no, that one because that would be the only one on here that's not. I think of the artist that's being included. Yeah, exactly. I'm not familiar with it, but you'd know better than I would. And no. Heartbreaker uh, with Pat Benatar and Neil Giraldo. Mm. There's tons of others too. This is just some of them. I'm buying that album. Mm-hmm. It's now available for pre-order. The first song in unoriginal titled the first song in unoriginal. Did I say unoriginal? <laughs> An unoriginal song. It's, yeah, it's derivative just garbage. It's, More know. Dolly Parton shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first song, an original titled World on Fire, will be available on May 11th. Joe says, uh, oh, it's his response to something he said earlier. Oh, Joe, yeah, yeah. Dolly is now dancing with Satan, putting out a rock album. <laughs> <laughs> he did say later that he was just kidding. Yeah. Well, Dolly has been crossing lines with artists. Like She doesn't, oh, she yeah. started as a country artist, but it's good to be the queen. I mentioned this story to my wife and she said, I was told of the story of this album and she said, and who are the proceeds going to? And I said, mm-hmm. it doesn't even matter. Cause if she gets all the yeah. proceeds, she still gives it away. So you don't, you don't yeah. have yeah. to earmark yes. it for anything. And if mm-hmm. she did, she deserves every nickel. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, Marcus yep. reminds yep. us that Prince's slave and his changing his name to a symbol, which I made, uh, I aptly named good doing. Cause that's what the symbol looked like to me. <laughs> good doing. The artist. Yeah. The artist formerly known as was all about Warner Brothers owning the master recordings to his music. So there you go. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. All right. Hey, finally, in sad uh, 1980s news, as reported by Variety and Pitchfork, MTV News is shutting down. Now, it's sad because, not because Mm -hmm. I I get my news from there. I haven't watched it in 30 years. I didn't even know it was still going. (laughs) Yeah. I really didn't. That was, I read it. I'm like, yeah. MTV still has news. Wow. <laughs> no wonder they're shutting down. If I didn't have a clue, when do they air it between crazy people in a house together and, and whatever reality stuff and, yeah. you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. jabronis from New Jersey or whatever the shows they have. When do they jabronis. run news? Jabronis on the beach. I'm sure there's a better name. For uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So. But yeah, apparently, but it, yeah. And again, like, look, we didn't even know it was around, but right. I guess being reminded, it's, it's a funny experience thing. Cause we're reminded first, Hey, that thing you liked when you were younger, it's mm-hmm. still around. <laughs> it's just got canceled. A shadow and of itself. It's gone. <laughs> and it's garbage. And you're done. Yeah. It's yeah. like yeah. putting yeah. John in the writer's room. Oh, sorry. Come yeah. back yeah. out. Yeah. Handing him a sign. Yeah, Joe was saying MTV News died a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's just now official. Yeah, I'd be curious what it looks like. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it would be a lot of news to me because they'd be talking about artists I have no clue who they are. Right. I'd be yeah. by the, by the, by the pen and paper like, who is this again? <laughs> little who? I guarantee it's little Lil Nas X? I know him now because he was in Muppets Mayhem. That's why I know who it is. Oh, oh yes. No I spoilers. saw him in the trailer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yep. Uh, mm-hmm. So the news program of the Game Changing Music Channel is shuttering operations after 36 years following widespread layoffs. 25% of employees across MTV Entertainment Studios, Paramount Media Networks, and Showtime were laid off on May 9th, roughly mm-hmm. five years after MTV had a significant uh, uh, layoffs in uh, 2017. Uh, mm-hmm. In a memo to staff viewed by Pitchfork, 
uh, Showtime, MTV Entertainment Studios, and Paramount Media Networks president Chris McCarthy wrote that senior leaders, quote, in co- coordination with HR, made the very hard but necessary decision to mm-hmm. reduce the domestic team by approximately 25%, end quote. Mm-hmm. Yep. I didn't, re- I, look, I knew I watched MTV News, but if you, mm-hmm. if I had to tell you what year it began and I didn't know, I couldn't recall. Uh, right. But apparently it emerged in 1987 with just the one show, The Week wow. in Rock, hosted by Kurt Loder, of course. That's, that's the, when I think of MTV News, that's all I can think of is yeah. I just see Kurt Loder mm-hmm. on that set that looked like they put it together with, you know, some pallets and crap they found backstage. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, it, and it had that grimy, independent look. And that's why I liked it. <laughs> the uh, show also included correspondents like Allison Stewart, Tabitha Soren, I remember Sarah Tabitha, and later uh, Meredith Graves. Hmm. Uh, reporting throughout the years. They're covered spanning music, politics, sex, pop culture, and more. And look, we're picking up the slack here on our own show here. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. It's kind of a bummer. I don't feel that bummed about it, though, since I didn't know it was no. there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. Brad said here in the chat, he's like, at least they provided some news 35 years later. Like, this is the first MTV news we've <laughs> heard in forever. And it's the news, news of their demise. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right, Kat, I'm going to give you a scenario, okay? Okay. You came, you came home today, you know, you weren't in your house at some point and then you came mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. It just feels like a normal day. Yeah. Right. Yep. Then you come home instead. Scenario number two, you come home, I'm there. And I say, Kat, earlier Simon Le bon was here, but now he's gone. <laughs> oh, geez. Now, would you be like with the MTV news analogy I'm trying to make? Well, I didn't even know he was going to, he was here. So it doesn't make a difference to me. Uh, that's a, very different scenario for me. <laughs> mm. Well, you think about that. I'm going to give you five seconds to think about that as we say, that was 1980s news. <laughs> Do you love 80s and 90s music? You freaking should. Yeah, because if not, you have issues. But if you do, then boy, do we have the podcast for you. The Mixtape. Yes, Matt, The Mixtape, where we chat about, well, 80s and 90s music mostly. Yeah, we sprinkle some other stuff in there too, though. A smattering of 70s and early 2000s. Throw in celebrity interviews, a lot of immature humor, and some actual content, and you have a hell of a good time. We do have a good time, don't we? Yes, we do. Check us out. Spotify, Pandora, Apple, iHeart, pretty much all the places you find podcasts. You can search for us, The Mixtape Podcast. That's four words. Find us, listen, subscribe, share, and stay Stay awesome. awesome. I wonder if listeners also kind of like, duh, duh, they dance along with the music like we do. (laughs) Like Kat does? Yeah. And you do sometimes? Mm -hmm. Do any of you dance with us? No. You dance with the music? Oh, come on, tell us. Craig, Craig, tell me you dance with us. Right. Come on. No, I know Marcus to... is absolutely shuffling when he hears the music. Oh, every day he's shuffling. And then we cut to every a live day. stream of the camera we have in Marcus's uh, living room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I See stab a voodoo doll to the beat. Kirk, Kirk. I see John flinching every now and then. Who's the doll yeah. of? Oh, that's why it looks like John's dancing. <laughs> You're right. I'm just getting, I'm getting poked in the half ass. <laughs> he's being forced. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, Char Craig says no. Dance. We sit on the couch with the cats. There you you can dance with so cats. They love it. Eating oh. and not dancing. Brad loves the intro music. Sorry, Marcus. Yeah. There you go. See? <laughs> Somehow word is getting out. The doll has great hair, so we know who the doll is now. Ooh. <laughs> Wait, what? I missed that. The doll, the oh, voodoo great doll, hair. has great hair. That's a gray hair. Either way, it would be me. <laughs> Both. Either way, you're a winner. <laughs> All right. Hey, as we uh, said earlier, we're going to be talking about 1980s radio, our experience with the radio, uh, you know, but I'm mostly curious about, and folks in the chat here live on uh, Facebook and YouTube, Mm -hmm. about your experience with radio in the 1980s, because it was fairly ubiquitous. And I do have some stats with regard to some things. I don't know to to what extent I'll bring these in, but um, uh, just to uh, sort of, I guess, provide some context, at least, that backs us up with a statistic, because then I feel like this this segment is legitimate. In okay. the 1980s, uh, a study revealed that 99% of American household owned a radio mm-hmm. as compared with 98% owning a television. And the average mm-hmm. American household had five and a half radios uh, in their homes. We're not talking about car radios. That's something else. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, those people were living large. I think we had like two radios. <laughs> <laughs> now, I guess at mm-hmm. some point in the 1980s, everything you bought had a radio built into it. I mean, you know, there you go. clocks had radios. And That's the yes. thing. That's the thing. Up. Right, because your it. yes, your hi-fi. It was called a hi-fi. Your hi-fi yeah. had a tuner in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you may have purchased a a receiver later 
that had a tuner in it. Mm-hmm. I had a six million dollar man accessory that had a radio receiver oh, in it. Wow. Yeah, you could listen to AM radio on this. <laughs> was it Oscar? This backpack? No, it was <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Uh, but yes, everything had a radio. So maybe you didn't buy five and a half radios, but I can yeah. see how easy it would be to end up having, yeah. even if you yes. listen to one yeah. or two of them, to have them everywhere. Because you probably each bedroom that has an alarm clock, as you said, probably a radio, yes. right? Mm-hmm. My boom box, my big Sony boom box has a radio mm-hmm. in it. My first yep. Walkman, it wasn't Walkman brand. It was a, a knockoff, <laughs> but that had a, a tuner <laughs> involved in it that I never used. I was always listening right. to tapes. But, mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. just another thing. You're right. I never used it. That's right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah Could yeah, you yeah. walk with a knockoff Walkman or does it start falling apart? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just like, do not rattle. Do not. Oh, yeah. no. It's a. <laughs> do not walk. Well, you, you, you just couldn't Mine, re- regular walk. You could get like a Dap Man or Strut Man. And you had to have Ooh, different well. walks. I see. My, mine was a sit on my bed, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had two of those. <laughs> Stereo. Quadrangle. Uh, Michael Quadrangle. says, I had a knockoff Walkman that was just a, a radio. Yeah, there you go. Just like a cat. Was yeah, yeah, not even a tape deck. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But as a result of you know, having five and a half radios it's sim- simply in your home, and maybe again, it was your microwave that did it or your refrigerator. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. And wow. in your cars. <laughs> Steve Austin backpack. It, it, it seemed to me, this is, again, and now this is turning to somewhat anecdotal, that we were able to, much like the 80s films that we enjoyed, that were scored with popular music, we wound up being able to score our lives, either consciously by setting what music we wanted to hear as we just went about our routines or we're just driving down the road, mm-hmm. or these songs, for me, uh, were playing at a time I had a significant memory of, you know, experience mm-hmm. that wound up, for me, becoming, you know, sort of uh, in, in, entangled or embedded, you know, together. Mm-hmm. So that they're inseparable. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll give you an example. Like I can't hear yeah. uh, "Turn Around, Bright Eyes." I can't <laughs> hear uh, Bonnie Tyler yeah. "Total Eclipse of the Heart" without thinking about being in a friend's, my next door neighbor's basement for her, like I don't know, thirteenth birthday party. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> wondering if I was going to slow dance with the girl. Ooh, nice. that kind of thing. <laughs> well, music has that same effect, yeah. just like to a lesser extent than like olfactory triggers, right? So you, Mm -hmm. you know, I think they say that like olfactory sin is connected to so much in your memory that you can just smell a smell and be transported back there. Absolutely. And I think to a slightly lesser degree, yeah, music is like that too. Mm -hmm. And often like for you, it's a moment, you know, for me when music from from that era hits, it's more of like a feeling like, like, wait, Mm -hmm. why am I feeling kind of sad now? Oh, because this song, like it, it happens Mm -hmm. unexpectedly. And then you have to figure out, like you have to trace it back and go, oh, because of this song is that whatever happened. I mentioned here before that, um, I had that experience with the guardians of the galaxy's first movie. It, and it was an eighties music, of course, in that, Mm -hmm. but it, Ooh, it just shot me back. <laughs> like I yeah. had to hold on for dear life <laughs> because I was like, oh my gosh. Because I can, yeah, I remember where I was when right. I heard uh, sure. some of those songs. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's true for me too, Kat, with that first film. In, in, in particular, because some of those songs I associate with my parents because it was a time when I first heard them, I was still living at home. I was still young. Yeah. Some yeah. of the songs were ones that predate our ability to select music. Mm-hmm. And I associate with them putting on a radio station. They would listen to that. Yes. And I don't usually then recommend films to my parents, but I remember having seen the first one. I was like, you guys have to see it. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Mm-hmm. Just knowing that in the very least, they would really appreciate the music in it. They would yeah. appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm saying some horrible things I know I need to cut out later. Uh, <laughs> not only our Facebook and YouTube audience has to be. Uh, we'll know what we do. That's right. Oh no. Karen says, what, what's funny is about a year ago that one of my friends from Retro Network, Adam, and I had same Sony CD player boom box. You know, I wonder statistically, it's probably pretty high though, right? I mean, I don't know sure. if there's many choices. I mean, maybe there were. Uh, well, well, yeah, that's a good uh, Brad says, uh, the slow dance was some serious, powerful magic work in the teenage years. A school sanctioned hug. Yes. <laughs> now you can't do that, right? I can't, they can't do that now. Yeah. So here's some things to make our, our conversation seem legitimate. And, and, and actually I'm leading to a point here and, and, and actually I'm, I'm reminded of this and I want to sort of, all, as we share our memories here to talk about this, as you know, so mm-hmm. uh, talk to, uh, again, listen to our conversation with Larry the Duck Dunn. Um, right. And part of talking to Larry that we learned is that, again, he was the music director for all of the 1980s, everyone's experience, <laughs> the whole decade, every year, <laughs> every moment. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. More, more particularly... <laughs> Uh, at WLIR in in New York. Um, But what we learned is unlike other stations at the time, he let his DJs play whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. Now they, they would get in new records, you know, and Mm -hmm. they had some, some stuff that would come in straight, you know, from England, from London, and they would have, they'd get it right off a plane in, uh, you know, at uh, I think JFK. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, they would have brand new music. Some of them were demos folks had never heard. So he would play, they would, you know, you have these listening parties and folks would hear this, this is, we've got this. But ultimately what they played was the, the DJs could play whatever they want. So they mm -hmm. had a lot of freedom. Now all stations weren't like that. Um, and part of the challenge as time goes on, we're going to learn here is that um, there's been great consolidation and uh, conglomeratization Mm -hmm. uh, Homogenization, all the Zations, all the bad Zations. <laughs> yes, all the bad Zations. Zations and the Zations. Um, mm -hmm. So until the 1980s, most commercial radio stations were affiliated with large networks such as ABC, CBS, mm -hmm. Mutual Broadcasting, NBC, and others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the traditional major networks that had dominated uh, American radio up until that point began to be dissolved. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a number of different reasons why that happened. So you still had a lot of, uh, you know, smaller regional local stations. It was more mom and pop mm -hmm. earlier in the 1980s. As we get, go right. on through the decade, though, things start to change. Let's stay with this for a moment, I guess. While we're in the 1980s still and early on. So uh, where's my little list here? Here it is. My, here's my list of memories and things I wanted to oh, mention. Oh, okay. You had to write them down because you didn't remember them? No, <laughs> I, I wrote them down while I remembered them still. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, in case you didn't remember them later. Okay. Oh, there's no chance I remember them later. <laughs> okay. You know what okay. happens actually is I get, I might have a little bit of anxiety that I won't remember them all. So mm -hmm. I, I can eradicate that entirely if I just put them all down. Sure. That's why I write down literally everything. Like, as you know, literally it says, welcome back to 1980s. Now, not that I don't know it. <laughs> I just don't have to worry that I don't know. Anyway. Don't right. What's the name me. of the show again? Oh, just uh, Will needs my... a therapist. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. Will needs therapy. Um, this predates the 1980s for me is opportunities to, uh, with me and my friends, my sister, pretend to be a DJ, a radio DJ. Why did that happen? Why, <laughs> what was it about radio that we were so enamored that we wanted to connect with Same. it in that way or do it ultimately? Mm -hmm. Did you guys do that? Oh yeah. I actually yep. have a tape of, uh, you still have, I don't have any of my tapes. I, yeah. I do. Yeah. Wow. I have one of us being really goofy mm -hmm. and pretending to be radio <laughs> DJs mm -hmm. <laughs> and we even had guests on. So we, we would impersonate wow. the guests and yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have a clip of that actually. So here's a clip of Kat and her friends and family uh, in the 1980s pretending to have their own radio show. And I challenge anyone to know, to explain what they're saying, what they're talking about, what the words are. Here's, here's Kat and company. Hello. Who knows my famous goodbyes here? Okay. Bye, George. Goodbye, everyone. Come back on. Come back and see us on Z100. Okay, we got my Wait, say I got Z100. This is Z100. Yes, it is. This is Z100. Yeah. Wait a minute, Ma. We got to finish this famous goodbye. We'll be right on. Yeah, right on. Okay, Skitter. My favorite thing is that you hear her mom calling for her. <laughs> you, you picked up on that? Yeah. Hey, kids. What is it, Mom? Just like Scott Shannon. You know what this is? At yep. every family get together, there was always one gang of girls who were off playing by themselves. And you heard the adults in the kitchen, they're rub, 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 rub. And you heard the boys outside, rah, just making noise. And then you hear in the room, squeak, like there's just chaos going yeah. on, rapid fire. And it just the energy, something about little girls when they get together in a room yeah. like that. I have to tell you at the end of that clip, yeah. my uncle, you can hear my uncle going, do you know what you guys sound like? That sounds horrible. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. oh, I wish I had gotten that far. I would have kept it in. <laughs> oh, I didn't have the, the cat and company morning show when I played to be a DJ. It was, yeah. it was just solo Johnny. It was all it is, but yeah. That would have gotten you out of bed though. To at least turn it off. God dang it! What is that? <laughs> it's cat in the morning zoo. <laughs> you, you want muppet mayhem? <laughs> oh, done. Oh, so much feedback here in the chat. Oh no. Marcus says sounds like they needed a will to rein them in. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant because they were going to die. <laughs> we <laughs> need a will. <laughs> <'Cause> their <laughs> uncle was about to kill him. Uh, Brad asks, uh, were you guys snorting pixie sticks? <laughs> Oh. Probably. No. <laughs> oh, thanks, Karen. She said it was awesome. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Karen commiserates us with, not commiserates, that's the wrong word, but remembers also <laughs> her fondness for DJs. Uh, remembering her career day in middle school, one of the local DJs, Domino from Power 99, came in. Oh. I don't remember any other, other guests because all we wanted to do was talk to Domino. Yeah. Awesome. 
the problem with radio personalities was you didn't know what they looked like. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, so they had this anonymity and then yeah. they would be the grand marshal at the Christmas parade. And you're like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Like it says he's from WXY do whatever. Stranger I'm like, danger. He's just some knucklehead <laughs> with a balding spot sitting on the back of a convertible. Mm-hmm. Give me a celebrity. I don't recognize him. <laughs> Miss So says that uh, my brother and I would record an album ourselves as tape as kids. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and uh, Michael and Brad, uh, folks, um, bring up uh, bring up something else. Another thing I want to talk about was Michael writes that early on, before I had my own money to buy my music, I would record my favorite songs on the radio on cassette. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, yes, Brad yes. writes, anyone else narrate your mixtapes like a DJ? Oh. So, kind of combining hmm. it. Hmm. So no. imagine you guys recorded your music right off the radio. I would wait. Oh, yeah. Sure. And wait and wait because yeah. I knew it was coming and I'd wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And some knuckleheads yeah. always talking over the beginning or the end all the time. Oh yeah. There's always. Yeah. Did That's you ever have a request or dedication that you were able then to record? You know, cat uh, out in Belmar has requested. <laughs> this one's for cat. Huh? I don't think I could yeah. ever get through. I'm sure I tried <laughs> yeah. to put in a request. Yeah. yeah. Never. I remember uh, calling radio stations just getting a busy signal all the time. Yes. Oh, yep. I tried to call for tickets, concert tickets. Yep. I can never. Well, you know the so. secret for yeah. calling for concert tickets, right? You oh, dial the first six numbers and hmm. then you wait until they say, call now. And you dial the seventh one. Oh. Mm. That Where way, were you when I needed you, John? You are, I was here in Florida. I, you're you're <laughs> that much further ahead of everybody. Now, maybe everybody else was doing that, but that, I always did mm-hmm. that. I, I knew the numbers, rotary, and they're like, and now yeah. call now to the 100 Zoo. And phones are open. One, so I hit yep. it up. How did you time that before you got the, eh, 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 eh. you know, if you dialed six numbers or whatever it was. I just do it over and over. It, it, okay. If I got the, bah, 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 I would stop and dial the first six again. Yeah, then absolutely. Right. You just do it again. When yep, you're dedicated. Yep, yep. I never won anything, but the, the system felt good. Marcus writes, every Friday night during the summer, <laughs> I was 12, I would hang out editing, <laughs> editing pizza. Editing pizza. Hang on, I gotta put my glasses that way, I told you. <laughs> Eating pizza. I went on the pizza. radio while editing I was listening pizza. to the radio to win next week's like, pizza from <gasps> WKMX. We're going to edit out this mushroom. We're going to edit out this little piece of oh, onion. Marcus. Oh, absolutely. Edit out that green pepper. a lot of free pizza. That's awesome. Sweet. But uh, yeah, I remind me, just what I wanted to mention with regard to recording stuff. I remember, you know, when hip hop, certainly they had uh, stations started playing rap music, you know, shortly after rap music started becoming popular. So it predated my, well, I, was, I guess I was interested in music, even going back to the Sugar Hill Gang and some of the earliest recordings of mm. rap music. And I had some of those records. <laughs> but on the radio, we had... <laughs> Uh, throughout the 80s, we had uh, cool, J, cool DJ Red Alert and Chuck Chill Out uh, were on uh, Kiss FM, and they would mm-hmm. DJ on weekends, like at 11 o'clock at night for a couple of hours. And so I'd wind up staying up if I wasn't already, you know, trying to just stay up just to record at least, hit record so that I could fit as much as I could on a tape, <laughs> maybe flip it over if I was waking up after 45 minutes, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And then it would be just, it's just nonstop mixing of one rap song after another. It was fantastic. Nice. The, the nerdy thing that I would do, because I'm sure somebody did it, but they were all oh. in their forties when they did it. And I was 13, but <laughs> I have the most eclectic taste in just auditory anything. I love old radio shows and mm-hmm. it, uh, just, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, like if, give me an album that's like uh, uh, full of Kentucky fried chicken jingles from 1973. <laughs> love it. Like anything <laughs> like that. Right. But I would stay up it. because in Orlando on WDBO at about 11 o'clock at night, they would run the then syndicated CBS radio mystery theater, which was effectively mm. a seventies version of radio drama from like the forties and fifties. And I would always fall asleep during them. But if I was awake, I wasn't supposed to be awake at 11, by the way, but I'd stay up till 11 say. to push well. record on my boom box. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the next day I could listen to this cool radio show in mono that played overnight and, uh, and they didn't talk over it because it was already, it was a show that they were talking right. in already. And it was always yeah. a mystery and somebody yeah. got killed or turned into a, you know, a witch got him or Frankenstein or something crazy. It was those monster shows, but loved it. Yeah, John, you know, you bring up a good point because while I'm focusing on music, there was tons of other types of radio programming that, that became, but certainly that predates the 1980s, but in 1980s talk radio became even bigger because of some changes mm-hmm. in regulation that uh, we won't get into, but um, yeah, other types of radio that uh, certainly uh, held our interest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was the other thing I was going to mention here? How much you like Cat and I? Well, hmm? yeah, but also, you know, again, thinking about uh, Larry the Duck, I like you guys a lot. I love you guys, both of, both of you, is um, how radio introduced us to new music. 
because, you know, LIR yeah. had the, you know, literally was introducing us to what they called new music and a lot of it was new wave, we think of it as new wave music, but I learned a lot of hip hop and rap songs that I hadn't heard, but for hearing them, Chuck Chilla, uh, you know, at midnight uh, on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And at that, at, at that time in the 1980s, a lot of stations, again, still had some flexibility, freedom with regard to they played. I'm mm -hmm. sure payola came into some of mm -hmm. it and, but yep. some of those things were regulated and technically illegal today. It's not the case. Now, technically folks can get paid, you know, to mm -hmm. play specific songs and it's a, mm -hmm. it's a source of revenue. But yes. uh, again, yes. comparing the 1980s where I mentioned to you how we had these, uh, the big networks, ABC and so forth were affiliated with radio stations. And then it, it started to get, uh, uh, broken up, dissolved as time went on. There was a law change in 1996 where they de deregulated uh, some aspect. The FCC was deregulating some aspects uh, of, of their uh, laws that govern these things, allowing radio st or, or large companies to buy up more radio stations. Hmm. There had been limits, which again gave us more variety and competition. I'll just, you know, I'm going to skip a bunch of this to go fast forward to. 37 years ago, 50 companies were in charge of most American media. Now, 90% of media in the U.S. is controlled by six corporations. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. But that's not enough for them because in 2020, these folks were again going before uh, the U.S. government arguing that, and because there's, there's still some restraints. There was a loosening mm -hmm. up in the 1990s, like I mentioned, but they were arguing that there's too much restraint still. And their <laughs> argument, get this shit. They were arguing that you have to make it so we could buy as many radio stations as we want because these hmm. little radio stations that are out there, they can't compete with streaming. And, and they, who's, who's going to help these guys? They're just going to go out of business. Wow. Meanwhile, the little radio stations say, we're fine. We don't, we don't, we're good. We'll, <laughs> you know, we'll compete or we won't. <laughs> we don't need all your corporate oversight. We're good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But these changes in the law, if they were able to get them to be passed, will allow these corporations to essentially buy most, if not all in certain circumstances, all of the radio stations in certain areas. Wow. And as I mentioned, a lot of the freedom that folks had in the radios, like, you know, like Larry had to introduce what they wanted to play or, you know, an interest mm -hmm. country to these bands. When you've got six corporations running, you know, some huge percentage that I've got written down somewhere here of the music, <laughs> they get to say what you hear and don't hear. Uh, I'll give you an example going back to the yeah. early 2000s. If you remember the Dixie Chicks criti criticized George Bush, then president during a concert. Mm. Um, I want to say it was Clear Channel. I might be wrong. Probably a good gamble. <laughs> they have a lot. <laughs> they told all their radio stations, don't play Dixie Chicks anymore. Yeah. Oh so do you gosh. think, Will, may maybe yeah. I'm tone deaf because I live on the internet, but yeah. <laughs> is the, the pull that these radio stations and now these media conglomerates have on what we listen isn't that diminishing somewhat with the advent of on demand? Listen to what I want to just say, mm -hmm. Hey, digital assistant, play me some Dixie chicks or the chicks yeah. or whatever they're called now, or, you know, chicken yeah. filet, whatever they call themselves, but you can play what you want when you want it. You're not at the mercy of what the DJ decides to put mm -hmm. out. Yes, you would think so. But the data actually suggests that terrestrial radio, even though it's been declining slowly over years, mm -hmm still pretty high. It's a high footprint. In fact, yeah. radio is still the highest, has the highest reach of any medium, including social media. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, whereas a radio reaches 88% of, of Americans each week. As a result, you've got 293 million Americans listening to radio every week as compared to only 180 million going on Facebook for information and entertainment there. Interesting. I would think there's a demographic schism there as well, because most likely, uh, maybe millennial let's say Gen Z and later, mm -hmm. I don't think they're listening to the radio. I don't think they have a radio. They don't have a boom box mm -hmm. that has a, a, a receiver in it, right? They have a phone mm -hmm. and they took the receiver out of a phone back in, like, there was a short time that Android had a radio receiver in, in a phone. They took it out. So you can't even buy a phone anymore that has it. And right. I think young people, just like young people are fleeing Facebook. I think young people, they're not fleeing radio. They're not aware mm -hmm. of radio unless they get in the car. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't request whatever this song is. Why is it playing? It just happens yeah. to be a radio on. <laughs> I think older well, people are more, uh, more susceptible to the influence of radio still. You know, John, I thought the same thing, but probably the most surprising thing I learned in reading about mm. this is that more than half of Gen Z listens to terrestrial radio. According really? to Edison oh. research, the AM How? FM radio reach <laughs> among Gen, Gen Z ages between 13 and 24 is high at 55%. Mm. Maybe it's a car thing. 
maybe when they drive. Like, <laughs> well, thirteen year olds aren't driving. Yeah. You mean like your parents would be? I mean the car, older Gen forced? Z's, like like my guys. Yeah, my kids. Drive. Or maybe the young kids yeah. have to listen to their parents who listen to the mm-hmm. radio. To John's point, sure. older folks. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yep. I don't know. Nothing mm-hmm. I read him it suggested that they were. You know, hmm. their consumption was because they were beholden to someone else deciding, or because mm-hmm. they had no other options. But even yeah, in yeah. cars yeah. now, the only time I listen to terrestrial radio is like if I'm in a uh, an Uber and the guy's got the radio on or mm-hmm. I rent a car and it doesn't have Sirius or something like that. Mm-hmm. Even then I sync my phone if I can and listen to whatever I've got <laughs> saved on my phone if I don't have signal. Yeah. But right, right. Again, like I said, I live on the internet, so I'm, I'm definitely skewed. And you have to consider there's a lot of people that don't live and die by their phones and they don't stay on the internet all the time. I mm-hmm. think Gen mm-hmm. Z mm-hmm. does, but I guess, guess I'm wrong. Uh, some comments here. Uh, oh, Brad asked about pirate radio stations. They used to be a thing. Arr. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's still happening, but I, I would say suggest you don't need them anymore because essentially anybody can have an internet radio station. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have to pay up. some sort of fee, you know, hmm. uh, maybe the pirate aspect, Brad, is fi- folks finding a way to do it without paying a fee. And I know there's, there's those out there because we've actually been approached by some of these internet radio stations to put our show on them. And it's like- mm-hmm. Shady. Oh, yeah. It's a shady. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yep. don't get any sense they're they're paying anybody to play these songs and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no one's gonna hear yep. our show on there. I'm with Michael. Michael's calling BS on that survey. It just, it just doesn't ring mm-hmm. true to me. I'm like Yeah, yeah. Yeah. L- l- so well, let's do a l- yeah. let's do a quick, quick survey here. None of us. Think mm-hmm. of ten people you know. Mm-hmm. How many of them have you seen or heard of listening to terrestrial radio in the last three months? Yeah, no. My number probably, zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Me. I would say not lately, but usually <laughs> during the warmer months, there's one <laughs> one or two neighbors. I you can hear they're listening to the they have it out okay. outside. And the I'll actual the local, radio, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'll hear the local DJ or ads right. or whatever like that. Gotcha. But yeah, no, to your point, mm-hmm. I agree. Anecdotally, no, not a whole lot of people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, and so look, as a, the sad thing is, unlike our experience in the '80s, where there was such diversity in music as a result of this consolidation, and you think about these generations that are coming up listening to radio that's owned by only a few companies. They're not going to be exposed to new music the way that we were. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Add to that to the fact that we, yeah, I don't think we ever, I don't think this made the air maybe, but we talked about a statistics where there's 128,000 new songs, new songs mm-hmm. released mm-hmm. every day That's via crazy. all the platforms, <laughs> streaming and so on. And this is going to sound like, oh, you know, I think, let's see, uh, uh, let me I have some here. Let's see. This, uh, this is the, the, the segment uh, called... Uh, I don't like everything the way it is now compared to the way it used to be. <laughs> I mean, it just... Uh, I feel for the kids. I wrote, uh, Music for me played such a romantic role in my life. I mm-hmm. associate music with certain loves I had mm-hmm. in my life, you know? Sure. Um, mm-hmm. So literally romantic in that way, but romantic in the, you know sort of a broader sense that I don't know that coming generations will be able to because of these changes and so mm-hmm. forth. So here do oh. do people still have yeah. our song? Is that still a thing? Hmm. Oh. The cool thing about our yeah. song is it yeah. was it was coincidental. It usually became your song. Yep. Because mm-hmm. of the circumstance, maybe it was when playing when you met or your first mm-hmm. kiss or your first <laughs> or whatever it was and you remember that song and then when it accidentally comes on the air you're like oh, yeah. what a great surprise you remember that person or whatever right yeah. and mm-hmm. and now since yeah. you can cherry pick what you want mm-hmm. anything is your song I mean, it's just uh, and maybe i don't know it's a thing i'm asking i don't know but i mean i i remember for each girlfriend i had there was a song like i still know what it is and when i hear it i still remember that mm-hmm. relationship mm-hmm. but i don't know mm-hmm. if there's that kind of if that's connected any longer in the same way i think so I, I mean, I think my son and his girlfriend have a song. I don't remember what Do it they? is. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if they told me, yeah. So a baby got back, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, so much stuff is, I'm going to cut Marcus out. Is, yeah. Marcus <laughs> is saying, why wouldn't they have a their song? Music still happens. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's cherry picked. You're like, right. I found mm-hmm. our song. And we you vet mm-hmm. it and you find out. I, th- I think that your song that I remember growing up, you didn't pick, mm-hmm. it picked you. It, it was what was... Mm-hmm. It, playing when you had a relationship or uh, blossomed or yeah. whatever. Yeah. It was I in agree. the background. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. These moments that I'm referring to were talking about these sort of triggers for me and the way that smell triggers memories. Mm-hmm. You're right, John. It was a song on the radio that just right. happened to come on. And yep. I could tell you where I've, this is serious. This is a real example. I could tell you where I was when I heard, when I hear push it, for some reason, I think of this moment at a traffic light in Bayonne, New Jersey mm-hmm. with my mm-hmm. buddy, Craig, mm-hmm. I don't know what we were doing, but 
that I'm transported right there. Yep. 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 <laughs> and I have several of those. You're right. Associated with different people. Mm-hmm. I don't, you're right. If, if you're, if the music is too curated, either because you're using an AI like Spotify or you're mm-hmm. listening to a playlist mm-hmm. that's already on your phone, it's mm-hmm. different. There's one thing for it to be organic. There's another thing for it to be manufactured. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of the magic of that discoverability and that association isn't yeah. there. If Look, if I want Danger Zone to be the song for every relationship, I'll just put mm-hmm. it on a loop now until I meet somebody. I'm like, hey, hey you're the one. Danger Zone's our song. That you can, a, you can wow. make it happen. I think it's a great That's a, so, <laughs> such a curious psychological, th- like had you thought about that when you were a teenager, first falling in love with people? That would be interesting to now look back in your 50s. Like what would yeah. that, what song would you have picked for that relationship knowing what you know now? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Right says, my concern is trending music bits on TikTok and such are what ends up trending with some 20-somethings I see mm. in my family. Yeah, you know, yeah. In, in, in the the thing I referred to earlier about the how many new songs are coming out was about an article that we wound up not doing on the show, was how the uh, some record executives were lamenting that artists are no longer developed because of t- these this phenomenon that Brad's talking mm. about. A new song mm. is hot for 24 hours. We touch on this a little bit with Larry. And it's gone. And that's it. Poof. But um, mm-hmm. uh, hmm, I feel like we're veering away from radio, but that's okay. We should be wrapping up anyway. Uh, um, what else? Anything can else? I say that's a probably few good things? Enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to jump in. I'm sorry. There's no I time. Tried. <laughs> I tried. And anybody out there hear me say, speaking of, well, I, 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 I. I thought you were talking to Brad. I'm sorry. <laughs> We thought you were saying hi to Marcus again. (laughs) I need a voodoo doll. Uh, (laughs) With good hair. No, bad hair. Bad hair. (laughs) Oh, that's me. Uh, With the ball cap. (laughs) With the ball cap. (laughs) Just thinking of the opposite. Um, Yeah. (laughs) It's not that I didn't get to say anything, but it wasn't anything I really wanted to say. (laughs) (laughs) Whose fault is that? (laughs) It's mine. It's completely mine. I just... um, Radio, <laughs> on the topic of radio, um, it, I feel like there's three different um, things that were important for me. One, when I was younger, pre-80s, it was on in the background, but only in the summer. Mm. <laughs> it just mm-hmm. wasn't something we did at any mm. other time. Okay. <laughs> because part of my summer was spent um, at a cabin in the Catskills. Okay. And we never listened to the radio at home. At home. Okay. It was never on at home. Mm. But in the radio or in the, this cabin, it was. And um, so I woke up to a lot of the songs that were popular, mm-hmm. popular in the 70s. And so hence my attachment to them. And um, in the 80s, music was super important as a, an adolescent. And we listened to Z100 like you did well. Um, Right. And uh, Craig mentioned WJLK. That was another station oh. that we used to listen to. And it wasn't, I don't hear any songs from that time and they don't, they don't transport me back to a certain time or place. But I think of my bedroom mostly <laughs> that I shared <laughs> with my sister. And because we, we chose to always have the radio playing as much as possible. And we even we got to paint our own room one time when I was, I forget how old I was. I was probably 12 or 13. And we had a whole wall dedicated to all of the artists on the radio <laughs> that we loved. And we, so we, you know, Michael Jackson was up there and of course Duran Duran and Boy so did, George. Did and you George, paint, like, like, did you paint the, the artists or like their logos? Their, their, their names and their, and some logos. Oh, some I was going to say, like, and we well, I want to see, I want to see your, your representation of like Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh, no, well, she don't. did a great Simon <laughs> from the calendar. <laughs> yeah, mm. that's too bad. Yeah, no, we did. Um, it was like, you would see it on an album cover. And, and if we weren't sure, mm-hmm. we just mm-hmm. kind of did yeah, it yeah. <laughs> like yeah. something kind of fun, but the wall, it was covered and we called it the music room. Mm-hmm. I wish I had pictures of this. There's probably, yep. probably pictures of this somewhere. Yeah. Um, and then another, another way radio was really important to me was, um, when I was in high school and I needed to get away from my family, mm-hmm. <laughs> we lived in a super small house. It was the, the second story of a two family home. And I had an aunt and uncle that lived downstairs in the summer, but it was just open or, you know, nobody was there in the mm-hmm. winter time. So okay. I would go downstairs oh. into their home uh, with their permission. <laughs> and that's where I would do my homework and I would turn on the radio. They enjoyed um, CBS FM from 101.1 mm, right. from New York. And 
I that's just what I would keep on. I think I was afraid of changing the station. <laughs> and you had like your own so little I, private music apartment. <laughs> I did. That's nice. And so wow. I loved oldies. They played oldies, right. and which I also loved uh, because I would hear that in the summer sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's all I had to say <laughs> about. She, she, was, she was taking notes of every time we shut her down going, I'm getting all this in. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> We're sorry, Kat. We did not mean to steamroll no. you. I did no, not mean no, to. I don't, no, I don't no, no. You guys were excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, seriously, you waved earlier, and so I really wasn't sure what was happening. I was waving at Marcus. I know, but I just wasn't sure anymore what your signals were. So I thought any of, if I keep stopping every time I see you do a gesture. I'm sorry. I get a little punchy when we're live. Psst, Kat, <laughs> may I suggest a new gesture to get Will's attention? Oh, oh. Yes, one finger, this one. <laughs> Before we get ahead of John. I, I have a slightly different recommendation, but along the same vein, yes. Uh, all right, hey, let's say that was our show. Hey, that's the show, everybody. <laughs> and this show, like all others, is brought to you every week, thanks in part to our early adopters <laughs> in life. <laughs> Brad, Brad wrote, throw a pickle. Laughing? Sorry. <laughs> Brad wrote, throw a pickle. That's throw a pickle. Out. Throw a pickle. <laughs> Squawk. I would like to see a pickle hit the screen. <laughs> oh, I would definitely get God has something to say. <laughs> I'm going to have some gherkins ready for you. Gherkins. <laughs> Goodness. You just made it, just made it that's, funnier, cat. That's, Throw that's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all bumpy, Marcus. too, with little warts. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, no. It's like the Marcus corn wants us to vote. He, Marcus wants to vote on the gesture. We'll get a poll. We'll do a poll. <laughs> um, what was I saying? I no oh, idea. our early adopters. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kathy Burke, yep. Rick Parker, mm -hmm. and Karen Flager. Yay, Karen. Yeah, tonight. Hey, thanks, Karen. Yay. And thank you especially to our secret of our success level Patreon supporters like John Henderson, yep. Craig Coletta, Go, Craig. Tony Great, Great. And, and these these three guys next are okay. all here with us okay. at some point tonight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Marcus Taylor, Whoop. Brad Bowman, BFF. and Nick Guillory. Yay. 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 Nice. Thanks, Thank guys. you so much. Yeah, that was great. And yes. we have a new patron. Okay, yes. It's, Are you about this? it's my one hit wonder buddy. Yeah. Keith Sheehan. Yay. Yay. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Thank you. Keith. Thank you yeah, so Keith. much, Keith. We are honored to have you in this capacity. We were lucky to have you help Kat. Because uh, no one else offered to help Kat in all these years, I don't think. <laughs> so mm, finally, mm, someone no. stepped up. Not John and I. We're not helping Kat. Uh, <laughs> Definitely so thank not. you for doing that. And thank you for joining us. Uh, your support means, seriously, it means the world to us in so many it different ways. It does. Thanks, thank you. Hey, if you want to be one of our quote unquote producers, uh, head over to <laughs> 1980snow.com slash support to find out how you can join in, uh, in, in that. But... Yes. If you want to, if you want to keep your distance a little bit, you can send us an email, send us we a message. It. If you don't want any part of this shenanigans, uh, make a post or, or email us. Uh, I'm Will at 1980snow.com. Cat is Cat at 1980snow.com. Cat with a K, K E T. Uh, or mm -hmm. you can message us on Facebook, which we also reside there. In fact, we got a message from Nathan who writes, Hey gang, I'm a long time listener of the podcast and completely forgot you folks had a Facebook presence. So we got to do a better job of letting yeah. folks know that. So I just started <laughs> following you today. I'm happy to say I can now put your faces with your voices. We're sorry. For, <laughs> I say I was going to pause for John to apologize. <laughs> uh, thanks again for all you do. And thanks for giving me and all the other 1980s now followers something fun to listen to every Monday morning. He shouts with two exclamation wow. points. Wow. <laughs> uh, and our buddy, uh, a spun counter guy over on Instagram writes with regard to our, uh, hmm, the, the, the prank show, which I, I mean, it had legitimate content where we did talk about oh. 1980 shows or shows that were too terrible to air, but there were <laughs> some fake ones and I played a horrible <laughs> joke on you guys that I felt guilty about. Featured my, my, uh, my arresting, so, not having a blast face, just like yeah, not having a blast face. <laughs> uh, with, re with regard to that episode, uh, Spun Cutter Guy writes, brilliant episode. Kudos to the writer of those shows. It was our buddy, George. George wrote those synopses, mm -hmm. those yeah, fake synopses. Uh, the thing yeah. is, it matches with some of those real shows in the seventies that were successful. Mm -hmm. You watch them now and think, how much cocaine did they have to snort to sign off on this thing? <laughs> three. Three cocaines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three cocaines. <laughs> three. <laughs> Whatever measurement you have. Three, three cocaines. 
Oh, or, hey, we will. Or, yeah. as is the current trend, you could stop by and leave a scathing review on iTunes. That's also an option. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Seriously. I need to get on a soapbox about that. That's hilarious. (laughs) Oddly misinformed. Ah, nice. Soapbox. I get it. it. All right. Hey, Uh, everybody. We will talk to you next time on 1980s Now. Until next time. Pasta lasagna. This podcast is part of the 80s Ruled Network. Visit the 80s Ruled on Facebook for more 1980s awesomeness.